you'd never think that the belly of this violin was made from solid wood. All the shaping has been done with little planes like this. The luthier even uses a little plane like this on the end of his finger to shape into these places. This little fella is a real working tool, it's not a toy. Woodworkers use a whole variety of planes for different purposes. Here we've got a few. Moulding planes, compass planes, combination planes, reboot planes and mitre planes, to name just a few. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at the bench planes. And these three planes we're going to use first to prepare a piece of deal. Why three? Well, they all have different characteristics. First, the wooden jack plane that I made at the beginning of my apprenticeship in 1945. When we rub wood on wood, it incurs far less friction than when we rub metal on wood. Thus, I can push off a shaving that's really thick, as thick as a soldier's belt, and bring the wood somewhere near the shape I want it. Unfortunately, wood isn't very stable. It's a soft material and it wears, and if there's a change in the moisture content, it's likely to twist. So the sole of this plane is never very true. That is why we change to the metal plane. This is the Stanley Bailey pattern, invented at the end of the last century by the Americans to overcome that problem. It has easy adjustments to the blade, and it's a reasonable plane to use. But even more precise is the British pattern plane, which is made out of steel plates dovetailed together. Again, it has an adjuster for the blade. And this is a super accurate tool, which is ideal for taking those last few shavings off of our work. Of course, I could use a machine. But just remember, machines are dusty, they're noisy, and they'll have your fingers off in a twinkle. How much nicer? to use a nice quiet bench plane, a really soothing occupation. Now before I can use those planes, they need setting up. And to set them up, we need to understand exactly how they work. So let's look at that next. Here we've got a brand new plane, straight out of the box. Let's set it up. Now the first thing to look at is the cutting action. And here we've got the cutting iron, which is pitched at this angle to the sole. This piece of wood has got a steep angle on this end and a shallow angle on that end. Think of these angles as the pitch angle of the plane iron. Now, if I push this steep angle into the pile of paper, it lifts the part cut off. We could call that a shaving if you like. The shallow end, exactly the same, but it has to do far less work now that applies to planes. This is a model of a plane iron. It's the cutting edge. And we can pitch it from very shallow to very steep. If we push it in at a low angle, it takes far less energy than if it's pushed in at a steep angle. But the low angle that works nice and easy for us tends to split the wood, whereas the steep angle tends to scrape the wood and there's no split. Now we can control that split in three ways. The first is, you will notice that as the plane cuts, the shaving forms a lever. And the longer it goes up the face of the iron, the longer the lever arm calls in the split. We can break the shaving up by putting a back iron on it. These are called irons by tradition. The old chippies made their own wooden planes and the local blacksmith made the iron. And being uneducated sorts, they referred to all ferrous metal as iron. So it's an iron and a back iron. Now what we're doing, as we push this in and take our shaving, we're breaking the shaving up. No longer is there a long lever. And the distance we set this back iron from the cutting edge affects the length of that lever. Well, now we've got two ways of controlling the split, the pitch 
and the back iron. But there's a third way. If we set the mouth of the plane fairly narrow so that the sole immediately in front of the cutting edge is pressing down on the wood, this again stops the split. So we've got three ways of controlling the cut. We've got the pitch, the distance the back iron is set from the cutting edge, and the closeness of the front of the mouth to the cutting edge. And we can take a nice clean shaving, completely controlled like that. Well, having got that far, let's now apply it to the plane. First we'll get rid of this. And now we'll take this beast to bits and see what makes it tick. This is the lever cap. Here we've got the two irons, the back iron and the cutting iron. And this bit's called the frog, which in turn is held into the body with these two screws. So here we've got the frog. And if we turn it over, we can see this brass wheel, which engages with this yoke casting, which is pivoted here, and the other end comes through the other side of the frog. This part engages into this slot in the back iron, like so. Now, when we adjust this wheel, it moves this yoke casting, which in turn winds the cutting blade up and down, thus adjusting the depth of cut. This lever here has got a little wheel on it, and that engages in this cutout in the cutting iron. And it's called the lateral adjuster, and as we move it from side to side, you will see that it's swinging the blade over. Thus we can adjust the blade this way and this way. You can see on the back of the frog, there's a little plate with a slot in it. And this slot engages in the groove in this screw. So we replace the frog, making sure that the slot engages. Now if we've got a really difficult piece of wood and we're only faced, or we only have a bailey plane and you need to increase the pitch for any reason, you can place a little bit of packing in here before you assemble the frog, thus tipping it up before we do the screws up tight. Now, we tighten these screws up really tight. They have an effect on the sole. Now the most important thing about a plane is that the sole be flat. This must be a perfectly flat plane. That's why the tool's called a plane, incidentally. We can test that with a straight edge, placing it right along the middle, and see if we can see daylight underneath it anywhere. And then we check it from corner to corner both ways. Now, if that was perfectly flat and a new plane, you're quite lucky. If it wasn't, you've got three alternatives. You can take it back to the shop where you brought it and complain, and he'll give you another one, which will probably be just the same. You can pay an engineer to surface grind it, which will probably cost you an arm and a leg. Or you can take half a day rubbing it on a piece of glass, nice flat glass, with carborundum paste to get the bottom flat. But I must emphasise, the sole must be perfectly flat. You probably notice this plane's got some grooves up and down it. This is called a corrugated sole, and it's purported that these reduce the friction. Now the blades bed on the frog and we can adjust the frog backwards and forwards by adjusting this screw here, thus effectively increasing or reducing the effective mouth width. 
Well, there you are, all back together again, with the exception of the irons. And these are going to need a terrific amount of work before they're ready to perform. So let's just look at them. We tighten them apart like this. Never like this, because if the screwdriver slips out, it's going to stab our hand. Well, here's the cutting iron. And this needs a lot of work because all of these deep grinding marks are going to be polished out until they look something like this. Right, how do we do that? Well first we need some room so let's put these over here and we get shot of these bits down here. And this is my old sharpening board to keep the bench top clear. This is a Japanese water stone that lives in water and is a thousand grit. This is the Japanese polishing stone. Now the first task is to flatten this before we try and polish it. It must be perfectly flat. If it is badly out of shape, we may need to use a diamond plate which will remove the metal very quickly although putting some deep scratches in which we can remove on our Japanese water stone. Now when you've got a nice flat grey matte finish on there, all that's left is to get the polish. So we come down onto a very fine polishing stone. And you will see that there's terrific suction between the stone and the iron. This means things are very, very flat and we we're really getting there. Well, there we are. That's good enough. We've got a narrow band of polish right along the cutting edge. And that's just where we need it. In use, eventually all this will become polished. Now, we finished this face, but what about this one? Well, let's go back and look at our models for a minute. First, let's look at this one. Now you remember, we've got two bevels. This one is ground on a grinding machine because this business is rather laborious and the grinding machine whips the metal off quickly. It's just this little teeny weeny bevel here at the end which we hone on the stones. Now then, what angle do we sharpen this at? Well that rather depends. If we go back to our original piece of wood with a steep angle and a very shallow angle, we can see that this part here is very fragile and will break easily. Well, this part here on the steep one is quite strong, but we previously saw that this wouldn't cut as easy as that. So the bevel is a compromise between strength and sharpness. You'll find for most work 30 degrees is about right. Now because Japanese stones are soft and they're easily damaged I like to use a honing guide. This one was made to my own design so unfortunately you can't buy it but there are lots of very similar things on the market and there we are that now will hone at exactly 30 degrees. 
We need to treat this bevel very much like we did the face of the iron. We're looking for an absolute flat surface that's really shiny and it meets the other face. Now when we're happy with that, we've got a sharp iron nail that cuts right across dead square with sharp corners. Now if you think about this, if we take a shaving with it, we're actually taking a groove, the thickness of the shaving, and it's going to have square edges. And we don't want that on the surface of our wood. So what we need to do, we need to do something about these corners here. They can be a variety of shapes, depending on what we're going to use the plane iron for. We've got some models here. Now, the wooden jack plane, because it takes really thick, crisp shavings, needs sharpening like this. We find that this shape will remove wood very quickly. Possibly these corners don't cut at all, but we've got a really thick shaving in the middle but we've got a ripply surface to the wood and we don't want that. But remember, this is only used for removing lots of wood. Our other planes that we're going to use for preparing are sharpened like this. They're dead straight with just the corners taken off so that we don't get that square left at the edge of the shavings. But even these little corners would be a nuisance on a smooth surface. So our smoothing plane has an iron this shape. We just round off very gently the corners of the irons. These are, on the real iron, imperceptible amounts. They're only just the thickness of a, an iron, of a shaving. So what we do... When we're shaping the iron, we just rock it to take the corners off. This is a bench plane, going to be used for preparation, so we put that little slope on either, either corner. Doesn't need to be very big, just enough to alleviate that square corner on the shaving. And there we are. That plain iron is now ready to use. But we've still got this bloke to contend with. And what are we going to do to that? Well, we've got to make this smooth, highly polished, so as the shaving comes off, it can glide up over there nice and easy. Also, this one's got a nasty square edge to it that the shaving's going to jam against. The easiest way to show you that is to compare it with my other back iron that is previously prepared. If you look at these two, you will see that this one is shiny and smooth, this one is rough and it's got a square edge. Well first, let's get rid of this square edge. And we do that by rubbing it flat on the stone, but we rock it so that we form this nice curve. This is fairly quickly done because the back iron is made of soft steel. It's not heat treated like the cutting iron. So we can abrade steel away fairly rapidly. When we're happy with the shape of this, we polish it with a piece of crocus paper. Well, there you are. That's nice and smooth and shiny. That'll do fine. Now, the next task is to fit this onto the cutting iron. Now the reason for that is, that's best seen looking at this model. If we cut a shaving 
and the back iron doesn't fit perfectly on the blade along here, the shaving will go between the back iron and the blade and it will jam up. And then as the blade moves forward, the shaving that's cut will gradually crinkle up and gag the mouth of the plane and planing will come to an abrupt stop. How do we know if this is a good fit on the actual cutting iron? Well, if we assemble them and we tighten up the blade, like so, we can hold them up to the light and we can sight along the gap between the two and we can see if any daylight is coming in between the two surfaces. Well, there we are, sharp and assembled. We can now put this into the plane's body. We just drop it in over the screw. I clamp it with the lever cap. There we go. We may need to adjust this little screw here just so that the cam on the lever cap goes over fairly easily. That was a little smidgen. There we go. It goes over nice and easy and clamps the irons. Now we need to adjust the projection of this iron. The easiest way is to place something white on the bench, sight down the face of the plane, adjust the projection until the iron is just visible and then adjust it laterally so that it's parallel to the sole and then we finally set it up until there's a minute little black line showing across the sole. Well, there you are, that's ready to use. So now we can look at the wooden jack plane. No nice adjusting levers this time, or little wheels. This may seem crude, but for hundreds of years this is how people adjusted their planes and it is very accurate. Hold the plane like this with the thumb on top of the wedge, holding the irons into the body. Give it a sharp bang on the striking knob like so and everything's nice and loose. There you are. This we deal with exactly the same as we did with the Bailey plane. No problems at all. When that's good, we can reassemble it. But first, let's go back to the body. Do you remember I said that the sole becomes out of true with wear and with moisture content? During the plane's life, we true this quite frequently with another plane. Nice, finely set shaving. If you look at the mouth escapement, you will see that it's wide at the top and very narrow at the bottom. So as we remove shavings here, what happens is the mouth becomes wide. And several times during the plane's life, we have to insert a little hardwood slip here to reduce the width of the mouth. That's known as remouthing. We assemble this in exactly the reverse procedure. Don't forget to hold it well with your thumb. Just gently cleanse that. We turn it over. Still holding the iron in with our thumb. And we just tap this end very gently until the iron projects slightly. We can adjust it laterally here. And when we've got that to our liking, we just give the wedge one final. And there's that one ready to use. Well, that just leaves the British pattern plane. Now this is made so accurately that quite honestly there's not a lot that we's left for us to do. Has a lever cap with a screw and we take the iron out like so. Now the big difference is the adjuster. This is the Thomas Norris of patent adjuster. It's not in all British planes but in the majority these days, and this is the tool. That is the adjuster. This flat plate is screwed into the body of the plane and the threaded rod has a ring on the end which fits over the screw in the back iron. Drops on there, just so. 
There we are, nice tight fit. Now the whole thing is in the plane like so. As we wind this, we adjust the iron up and down and when we move it laterally from side to side, it pivots the iron this way. This is a very, very precise and accurate adjuster. Exactly reverse procedure. We wind the adjuster to get the projection just right. We adjust it laterally until it's parallel. And once the iron is set exactly where we want it, we give the lever cap screw a final tweak and there's our British pattern plane ready to use. Well, that's all three planes ready to go. Now that may have seemed a bit long-winded, but most of those things we've done only need doing once during the plane's life. And some of those planes are on their third human life. I'm the third generation to use them. So possibly it was great granddad that fettled them. Let's go and use them. Woodworkers spend a lot of their time planing. So it's important that we position the tools we're going to use on the bench in a convenient position. For planing, we put our planes here on a strip of wood. This keeps the front end off the bench and stops the plane iron touching the bench and becoming blunt. We don't want to waste all that time we spent sharpening them. You may have been told to place your plane on its side like this. But that's got one big fault. If there's another tool on the bench and it gets knocked against the edge, you've really got some work to do to put the matter right. Not only that, when you're going to pick it up, it's difficult, whereas this is very convenient. We said earlier on that planing causes friction and we need to lubricate the sole of the plane. Some people use paraffin wax and they dress the bottom of the plane like this. But we've had to pick the plane up, turn it over, find the wax, put it away. It's time consuming. How much easier to pick our plane up and drag it straight back over an oil wick. We dress the oil wick with a smidgen of linseed oil. Not very much, because we don't want to get that oil on the workpiece. Well, there's the piece of wood we're going to plane. It's come straight from the timber merchant and the guys have probably walked all over it with their hobnail boots. There's grit in the surface, it's been stored in the open, in the dust. So we get rid of all that by just wire brushing the surface. We don't want to blunt our plane on that grit the minute we take the first shaving. So there we are. We need to make the wood flat so that it sits down on the bench. That's where our wooden jack plane comes in and it'll take a real thick lump off until we can sit the wood down properly. Now if you were going to go and play golf, you'd pay a lot of money to learn to stand properly and hold the clubs. Nobody ever thinks of that with planing, but it's important. So let's just look at things. When we're planing, we don't want to use our arm muscles. If we stand beside the work and work like this, it's all muscular and that takes a lot of energy. But if we get behind the plane so that we use our body weight and the upper torso is behind and propels the plane, it's much easier. Getting our feet right is quite important as well. On a short piece of wood, we don't need to walk the length of the bench. So we place our right foot at right angles to the bench and our left foot pointing along the bench. Position ourselves just behind the end of the wood and hold the plane so. Now, this hand, you'll notice, the three fingers around the tote and the forefinger is pointing forward on the top of the iron. We hold most of our woodworking tools in this way because this finger feeds back the information of how the plane is orientated like this. If we grip it so, 
there is no feedback. We don't know how the plane is positioned. So there we go. The right hand, sorry, the left hand, comes forward and presses down on the front like so. It is positioned slightly different to this when we plane the edge, but we'll look at that later. So let's take a shaving. We start here, pushing down with the front. As we get to the other end, we transfer the weight to the back of the plane. Thus, the plane is positioned flat on the wood at the start, transferring the weight evenly in the middle, so it's down firmly, and at that end, there's no weight on this hand, it's all on the back, keeping the plane flat. Well, there we are, look, that fits pretty flat on the bench now. So we can begin work proper. We're going to prepare this piece of wood. Now, what do we mean by prepared? Well, first and foremost, we're going to make this flat surface absolutely flat and really straight. This we will call the face side, and we will mark it for reference. When we've got that true, we will plane this edge square and straight to this face and we will call that the face edge. When they are right we will plane the wood on the back so that it is exactly the same thickness right throughout its whole length. And last we'll plane it for width to make sure the width is exactly the same throughout the whole job. The back will be true to the face and the far edge will be true to the face edge. So what are we going to do? Well let's look first. We can see that there's a pronounced round on this wood so we need to take some out the middle. That's a job for the wooden jack because there's quite a bit of wood to come out. When we've got it reasonably flat, we can change to the bailey. Do you notice the difference? Totally different cut. And if we tried to take that big bump out the middle with this, it would have taken us about five minutes instead of those few seconds. If you want to make a quick check, just to see if you're getting the wood flat in its width. You can always just put your plane across quickly to see what the state of play is. When you think you've got it flat, you need to check it. We do this with a straight edge and we put it along the work and we sight to see if we can see any daylight underneath it. There we are. You will see that this has got a slight bump in the middle. I can just rock the straight edge. So we want a few shavings out the middle. There's a point here. This is an old fashioned low knob and I can get over the top and hold it down. The modern Bailey planes have a tall knob which you have to hold like this. Um, I don't find that works for me. Well, let's check that again. Well, now I'll accept that as being straight. But, is it twisted? To check that, we use a pair of winding strips. These are made from two pieces of dark coloured wood, in this case black walnut, Juglans Nigra, and they're absolutely parallel. These two faces 
must be parallel. So both of them in the width are dead true. Now I can't overemphasize that because any inaccuracy in these will be reflected in the workpiece. So if these are wrong, everything you're playing is wrong. Put one either end of the work and we sight through to see if there's any twist. And in this case, we've got some twist. This is high here and high there. If you haven't got a very good memory, just mark it with a bit of lumber crayon. A few more shavings then. So we go from this side to that side. Just check again to make sure you haven't put a round on the job. That's fine. Winding sticks. Wow, that's great. So there we are. That is now flat and straight. And we're going to refer to that because it's a datum face and we need to mark it. So we use a piece of lumber crayon and we put a mark on here like that. Now by tradition, that is the top of a lowercase f. And it dates back to the days when the master would mark a line on the work, a straight line I hasten to say, on the work, and he'd mark it with an f. When it was ripped down, each piece would have a face mark on it. Well, there we are the face. Now we need to plane the face edge. And as previously said, that has got to be absolutely flat, dead straight, and at 90 degrees to this face. We could hold this piece in the vise, but it's better supported if it doesn't come up too high on the surface of the bench. Again, we remove any grit. few shavings with the wooden jack. There we are. You can see the difference there, look. That's the jack plane shaving. Real thick, crisp one. There we've got a much finer jack. Now, we think that's straight, let's check it. So we check it again with the straight edge, just as we did the face side. Now we need to check it for square. Is it at 90 degrees to the face? No, there's a little bit of light underneath there. Now you may have noticed that I'm using an engineer square. Why? Well, Let's just look at a recently bought woodworking square. You will see that we've got quite a nice looking tool, big long blade, held in just this little area with four rivets. Now it doesn't take much of a knock to put that out of true. How can we check if this is square? Is, is this 90 degrees? It's quite a simple method and we do it like this. We use a board that we've planed perfectly straight on one edge. We draw a pencil line, keeping the stock tight against the straight edge, and we put a fine pencil line across. We turn the square through 180 degrees and offer it up to the line. And any discrepancy is twice the amount the square is out. As you will see, that in that about eight inches of board, this square is a good sixteenth out. A tool that's not accurate is no use to us at all. We could buy a woodworking square by paying a few pounds more that has an L-shaped blade. In other words, this piece of metal goes right down the full length of the stock, whereas this one is just there. 
This one has only four rivets, the same as that, but they're spread over the whole area of the stock. So, therefore, this is a much more trustworthy tool than that. But even so, I like to use these engineer squares because they're made to a stringent British standard spec, stamped on the blade, and I can trust them. So back to our workpiece, and we check it for square. And as I said previously, it is slightly low on this edge here. Now, because it is only slight, I'm going to adjust it with the British plane, which is set up to take a very, very, very thin shaving, as you can see. And believe it or not, that shaving is about a thou and a half thick. So we're working to quite accurate dimensions. There we are. We have another look. And we've still got a slight little bit of light under that end. So we come up. And as we come to that end, we come over to one side. So full width here, over to one side there. And then we try and take one shaving the full width of the wood, the full length of the wood. You'll notice how controlled that shaving was. I can only do that with the British plane. So, one final check. Yes, I'll accept that. Is it square? Yes, I'll accept that. Now, we need to mark that. And we mark it with a V which points towards the face mark. So now we've got two datum faces and everything we do to that piece of wood in future will work from those two faces. We now need to make this backside parallel to the face. So we can have to mark that in some way. Now we use a marking gauge for that. And like all tools, there's good ones and there's bad ones. I've thrown all the bad ones away, so I can only show you the good ones. This is the normal marking gauge that you will buy today in the shop. It's got a plastic screw, but that doesn't matter. This is a nice old rosewood one, which you'll see is a much better fit than our modern tool. The pin here, when you buy it, will probably protrude far too much. It needs knocking back or pulling back. So we're going to set this up to the width of the wood. So we're going to take a shaving and we will check round to see that this is within reason. And if we want to adjust this a small amount, I haven't tightened this screw up really tight, it's just pinching at the moment. I can tap the stock on the bench like that and it will adjust the the pin, a little bit more. Okay, that's fine. Final tight up. Now most beginners have a lot of trouble with this tool and the reason is they don't understand quite how to use it. They try and push it into the work, the full depth of the pin, and make a line. And the pin engages in the grain of the wood and it just follows the grain and you get a straight line about as straight as a donkey piddling in the snow on a windy night. So press the wood somewhere so you've got it firm and we trail the gauge. We trail the gauge like this so the pin is only just touching the wood. So we go down here and we've got a fine line. We now trail the pin, not quite so much. We've got a deeper line. We now press the pin right into the work, it's full depth. And we've got a nice deep line. We do the same on the other edge.
Well, there we are. We've now got a line showing us the width that we want to plane the wood to. But there's something I want to make clear to you, and the only way I can do that is to run a pencil line inside the gauge line. You wouldn't normally do this, but there's something I want you to see in a minute, which is very, very important. And the only way you'll see it is if there's that pencil mark. Okay, well you can see there's a wee bit of wood to come off. So we go back to our old friend the jack plane. And we'll have a, a, a few of it here. Keep your eye on the gauge line. Remember to keep your body over and behind the plane. You will see I'm beginning to approach the line. get this close I can change planes and you'll notice that the edge of the wood is beginning to fluff from the gauge line. Now the gauge line is beginning to break through the surface of the wood. Remember you still want it flat, it's very easy to round the wood, so you can check it with the edge of your plane if you want, just to make sure. If we look, we can see that the edge of the gauge line is beginning to break away. You can see it here very clearly, look. That's half the gauge line just coming to the surface. If I take the British plane now, I'll just bring that to absolute truth. Now that's taken all the high spots off that were left by the Bailey platen. And there we are. This is now flat and parallel to the face side. All that's left now is to plane it for width and we need to use a marking gauge again very similar operation to before might be a bit of a problem marking gauges have fairly short stems and if the wood is of any width you need a panel gauge and a panel gauge is made by the craftsman himself and it looks like this. In actual fact, some bright spark has used this and left it set up all over the shop. There we go. So we will set this up to the width of the wood, which could be anything up to about two foot. This has got a little rebate on it that fits on there and we can now gauge a wide piece of wood. The panel gauge. Right, back to our ordinary marking gauge. 
just check that that is reasonable. Of course, if you had to work to dimensions, you'd set this up to a rule. But we don't usually do that. We're trying to get the biggest piece possible out of the material we're given. Here we go again. You'll notice that I'm holding the gauge slightly different now because it's marking to its full width. It's very easy for this to happen. So you place it on the wood and pull. Pull the stem towards you. Again, do the task in three sweeps exactly as before, trailing it the first time. Let's trail the second. And full depth the third. There, look at that. We can have one or two crisp shavings first. We'll lose some of that. There we are, look, breaking through into the gauge line again. You can just see there's a little chamfer on the edge of the wood that the gauge made. Not quite this side, so we pull the plane over, take a controlled shave in there. Last one with the British pattern plane. Trying to get that shaving the full width, the full length, and not go past our gauge lines. Well, there you are, plane down to the gauge lines. Now we've got a piece of wood that is prepared, which means we've got a perfectly flat and straight face side, a face edge, dead square, 90 degrees and straight. We've got the back side plane parallel to the face side, and we've got the far edge plane parallel to the face edge. So our piece of wood is ready to do anything else with. That's it, it's prepared. Remember that these two faces are the datums. Everything is measured, gauged or squared from them. For instance, if you're using a square to put a square line around the work, the stock goes on the face edge and on the face side. Never on the back edge, so it's turned over and squared from the face edge and the face side. And if you go right round with a line like that, and it doesn't meet up, it can be two things are wrong. Either the square's out of kilter, or the wood ain't straight. Now, okay, so that's preparing that piece of wood. But that was relatively short, and we could stand still and do it. What happens if it's longer, and we need to move with the plane? Well, Let's look at that next. There's very little difference. We start at the end exactly the same as we did with the short wood. We get behind the plane, over the plane, You'll notice my feet are exactly the same as they were before. Press down on the front of the plane, start the shaving, and as soon as it starts cutting, walk with the plane, the full length of the work. Put your weight on the back of the plane as it leaves. It's exactly the same as before. Remember that the body is over and behind the plane. You're sort of leaning on the plane to propel it forward and to keep it flat on the work. So let's have a shaving off of that then. So away we go. Away we go. Becomes slightly easier as we take a smaller shaving. Now once it's going, the plane is propelled 
by the body weight. In other words, if you look carefully, you'll see the body is over and behind the plane. I'm literally leaning on the plane, so it's being kept down flat on the work, and it's sliding away from me because the weight is behind it. At no point am I using my arm muscles. I'm just using body weight. And I'm moving along the bench just enough to complete the shaving. You see, we're getting a shaving the full length of the wood. So preparing this is exactly the same procedure as we've previously done, except we need to move a bit more. You've probably noticed that I've been using planes of a medium length up to now. Well, we have shorter planes and we have longer planes. Why? Let's look at that next. Now I've got this horrible old bit of chipboard and I've bandsawed a curve on this surface, quite a pronounced curve, to show you the effect between short and long planes. You can see the bow here, and the short plane will fit down into that. In fact, if I didn't care about my plane iron, I'd probably take a shaving or two there, but in no way am I going to plane a bit of chipboard. You'll see that the long plane won't have anything to do with the curve. Look, I'll get my fingers underneath it. Now what does that show us? Well, if you think about it, a short plane will plane a scalloped face. A long plane will plane flat and straight. And that is what we want to do. This is particularly important when we edge joint boards. And that's what we're going to do now. I've got three boards here, which could be a typical job. They want joining together along here and here to make one wide surface. Now it is very, very easy to get these joints muddled up. The best thing we can do is to use this device. There we go. That's known as a cabinet maker's triangle. And it doesn't matter how many boards we've got wide, we can see their orientation and how they go together, providing they make one triangle. So let's start off with our first board, like so. Now, the edge of this is fairly narrow, and that means it's difficult to keep the plane dead square. So some craftsmen would put the face of this board to the face of that one, like this, making sure that the top surfaces were level, and then they would shoot that surface. Incidentally, we call this shooting, long joints a shot, and this is a shooting plane or a jointer. I don't go much on this idea. It's done like this, they say, because if it's planed out of square, when you turn this board over and assemble it on there, you turn it over and assemble it on there, they're out of square a complementary amount on each board, so it's going to fit regardless of whether they're square or not. But if you think about this, suppose they'd been playing slightly round. Well, then you would have doubled the roundness. So I prefer to work one board at the time. I'm going to start off with this chap. This again is a Bailey pattern plane, but you'll see it's slightly different. It's called a bedrock. And this was a different pattern of frog to stop the plane shattering. There was complaints that the early Stanley planes chattered and they brought this out to try and counteract that. So away we go. No great problems. 
two or three shavings with this chap until we fill the edges reasonably square and straight. Then we move over to this chap, which is a wee bit longer. Yeah, look at those lovely dovetails. Here we go. Exactly the same procedure. Nice, steady shaving. Try and take a shave in the full width of the wood and the full length of the wood. When we've got a couple off like that and we feel fairly confident, we can pop down this end and sight through the length of the wood and see if we think that's straight. Now, it's almost impossible to plane the wood hollow, but it's quite easy to get a slight round. So, in planing the edge, what we try and do, we try very slightly to plane it hollow. This one has actually got a slight round on it, so I'm removing a bit out the middle. And one last shaving, the full length. And then we check the edge, just to see if it's square. Okay, we finished with that one for a minute. So let's take the next one in the triangle and pop him in the vise. Couple of shavings with the bedrock. Back to the English pattern plane. There we are. We've got a funny bit in the middle here. Not quite getting a full width shaving, that's better. There we are. Now we can try this chap on top. What we'll do so that we can see the triangle, we'll put this one in there and we'll assemble this one on the top. Now you can feel by the drag as you place it on that you've got a pretty good fit. And we get down here and have a look to see if we can see any daylight through. Yeah, we've got a little bit at either end. We need some out the middle. So a couple of good shavings out the middle. When they make wooden aeroplane propellers, they shoot four inch boards flat together and laminate them with a plane like this. Eight or nine boards for each blade. That's eight or nine joints. And then they inspect them, the inspector comes along with a bicycle lamp and a tooth owl feeler gauge. And he goes along the back with his bicycle lamp and if he can see any daylight, he tries to poke his tooth owl feeler gauge in. And if he can get that in there, you've got to shoot it again. That is a good joint. Okay, so that's number one. We shoot number two joint. There we go, back to our British pattern plane. We love using this old chap. Look at that shaving. Thing of beauty. There we are. We'll just have a look. Yeah, very slightly rounded. There's always a tendency for it to be rounded. So as I say, we, we try and plane it slightly hollow. And 
one. There we go. Last of all, this chat, we've got a rather nasty piece of wood there. Never mind. If you had the width in this, you'd probably take the jack plane and reduce the wood past that whiny piece. When you've done this a few times, you begin to get a good feel for your tools. You can tell when it's straight. Don't ask me why, you sort of get a feeling in your water that it's straight. Still not quite there. This one should do it. No, still a nasty in the middle. Can you hear how it's taking a shaving at both ends and nothing out the middle? There we are, and then they start cutting again. One more. That's good enough for us to try a trial fit. Our triangle is there, and that's pretty good. I can feel that as it assembles, it's biting nicely. Now, yeah, that's lovely. Now, it's important that when our board is glued up, when these butt joints are glued up, that the board is flat. So as we shoot the job, and we stand the boards together, we just test them with a straight edge to make sure that allowing for any curv curvature in the width of the boards, the thing's going to be reasonably flat. That's great. So, there we are. Look, we've now got our three boards with the two shot joints. Of course, we might work a tongue or some other form or maybe some dowels in those joints. But believe me, if they were glue, rub glued with hot melt glue, we'd have a beautiful flat board. And quite honestly, when that was glued up, like that, you wouldn't see the joints. The only way you'd know they were there was the mismatch of the grain. Well, okay. Now we talked about these boards being narrow and what a difficulty it would be to keep the plane square on the edge. Well, there comes a point where that is an impossibility and we need to use a device like this called a shooting board. So suppose we have to shoot the edge of a board this thin, absolutely square. We'd place it on the board like so and we would use our jointer on its side to take shavings off like so. Because the bottom of this rebate which the plane is running in, is absolutely parallel to this surface. The plane has been ground perfectly square, the sole to the sides, so we know that the blade is cutting at 90 degrees to the horizontal, therefore this edge must be square to that face. Easy, ain't it? So far, I've talked to you about bench planes in the medium length and long ones. Now we're going to look at some of the short ones. These are smoothing planes, and they're probably the last planes used on a flat surface. Here we've got three Bailey planes, exactly the same procedure in fettling them as we did with the other Bailey. There is a little teeny weeny baby smoother made by Bailey, which is a number one. There's a little bigger one at number two, 
But the first one that is really of any use is the number three. This is a number four, and this is a number four and a half. So that is the Bailey pattern smoothers. We come over to the English pattern. This is a Thomas Norris of London with the Norris adjuster, which we looked at before. It's got the same sort of lever caps as all British planes. This is a British pattern, but I made this one myself from a casting which I brought from Bristol Designs and fitted a Norris adjuster. Over here, we've got an old family heirloom. This is at least a couple of hundred years old. It was great great grandfather's. And if you look carefully, you can see where thumbs gripping that over the years have worn that very hard rosewood away. I'll commune with my forefathers when I put my thumb there. And last, we've got a Bismarck. Now this is a German plane. The German cabinet makers reckon that these metal planes are amateur's tools, lay like wood. The body is nearly always made of fruit wood, apple, pear, cherry. The sole, that's a piece of lignum vitae. And lignum is very, very oily, so the sole is self-lubricating. And it's toothed on and glued to the body. And it even has an adjustable mouth. The only thing about that tool that is different is the Norris adjuster, and I fitted that. Of all those, I probably use this plane as much as all the others put together. I built this myself for a purpose, just for the weight, the smallness of the mouth, and the size. And it works ideal for the sort of thing I do. Now I've got a piece of afcelia here, which you probably know is a horrible wood to work. The grain is quite wild, and I'm going to smooth that with this chat. Again, we lubricate the sole on the oil wick and we can take shavings off the surface, which is coarse, already nice and flat. We can cheat here a bit because we're not interested in this being absolutely flat and straight anymore. We finished making the thing. We can put the plane at a slight angle. Now you'll notice that the shaving's curling out the side. Now this is a bit of a cheat. Do you remember when you rode your bicycle up a hill, how you went from side to side and it sort of flattened the hill out? Well this is the same. What we're doing, we're making the shaving come up the iron at an angle. So in effect, we're cheating and we're lowering the pitch of the plane very slightly. We might not always want to do that, but it's a good tip. On a piece of wood like this, you'd find you'd be sharpening about every three or four minutes because it's quite gritty and as you can hear, the edge on this plane is going already. But well, that'll do because that is as smooth as a baby's bum. So I've shown you medium sized bench planes which we use to prepare the wood. We've used long jointers to edge joint boards. We've used much shorter planes to smooth the wood. But there are a dozen more planes, all different types. Quite a few have been used to make this linen fold panel. The styles and rails were prepared with bench planes. But we've got a groove here, which was done with a plough. The beads are worked with a beading plane. We've got a rabbit here that was cut with a philister. A lamb's tongue moulding round here that was worked with a moulding plane. And then we've got the linen fold itself, which was worked mainly with hollows and rounds before the end was carved. So you will see there are dozens more planes. There's a whole variety there. And I'll talk about those in our next video. But what I would say is if you can't prepare your wood straight and true to start with, you can't make anything, can you?